non rock a boatus must stop. I don't want to rock the boat. I want to sink it. Are you going to bark all day, little doggy, or are you going to bite? Brett, delusional. Yeah, I love the Jets. Delusional. Yeah. Delusional is okay in your worldview. I'm an animal. You don't chastise chickens for being delusional. You don't chastise pigs for being delusional. So you calling me delusional using your worldview is perfectly okay. It doesn't really hurt. <laughs> she hung up on me. Yes! Yes! Oh my God. What? What? Desperate times call for faithful men and not for careful men. The careful men come later and write the biographies of the faithful men, lauding them for their courage. Go into all the world and make disciples. Not go into the world and make buddies. Not to make brosives. Right. Don't go in the world and make homies. Right. Disciples. Well, I, yeah. got, I got a bit of a jiggle neck. <laughs> <laughs> That's a joke, Pastor. No. When we have the real message of truth, we cannot let somebody say they're speaking truth when yeah. they're not. Take an amazing journey. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and correction. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, y'all. Welcome back to another episode of Apologia Radio. This is the gospel heard around the world. You can get more at apologiastudios.com. That's A-P-O-L-O-G-I-A studios. Dot com. Apologiastudios.com is where you go to get more of the episodes, podcasts. You have so much there. You have uh, Provoked, you have Cultish, you have Sheologians, you have Apologia Radio, hundreds of episodes from when we were on terrestrial, terrestrial radio and all of our podcasts. You can also sign up for Apologia All Access when you do. You make everything that we do possible and you get all kinds of additional content, including Ask Me Anything, which is a once a month situation where you log into a private uh, feed and you get to kind of hang out with us, ask questions, engage. It's a little roundtable discussion with all of our supporters. So I want to thank you. If you haven't seen it yet, I'm going to encourage you guys to check out our Apologia Studios channel on YouTube and uh, look over the last, say, two weeks or so of content. We've been able to have some uh, some really great, uh, fruitful conversations on the street. We dropped something from LSU, Louisiana State University, when we were there for our bill uh, of equal protection and abolition. We also dropped some stuff uh, from the Mormon Temple in Mesa, Arizona, from our evangelism out there. And when we were just in um, uh, Salt Lake City Valley uh, for our church plant that's out there, uh, Pastor Wade is out there doing an amazing job. And uh, we got to go to Provo, which is uh, sort of the hometown to BYU, Brigham Young University. And I got to engage with some return missionaries. We also have some more content that is coming soon. I want to say a big thank you to all of you guys who are part of this ministry with us. Uh, you're in this ministry with us. When you sign up for Apology All Access, you make all the content possible, whether it's the evangelism videos, um, even stuff for EAN and Abortion Now, um, or if it's the teaching ministry, whatever it is, if you've seen an Apology of Studios, it's because someone just like you has signed up for All Access and um, you're part of this ministry with us. So I want to say thank you. Uh, of course, as always, I don't want to forget to announce that you should get your free, free, free account, completely for free uh, to Bonson U at ApologiaStudios.com. You will get some of the best seminary level education uh, that is possible. Dr. Greg Bonson uh, left a treasure behind with all of his years of preaching, teaching, his debates, his teaching in seminary. And so we have close to 2,000 uh, lectures uh, from church and from seminary, as well as some video as well that's going up at Apologia Studios. Bonson U. It is free. It's a gift to you from the Bonson family. They've entrusted uh, all of that to us, and so we're giving it to you. So don't miss out. Uh, don't neglect getting that free account and getting some of the best Christian education that is possible. And I mean that. That's Luke the Bear. What up? That's Joy the Girl. Hello. And they call me the Ninja. And we're here today to talk about a couple of things. We're going to talk about uh, homeschooling. We're going to talk about public school education. We're going to play some videos that are going to light your hair on fire. And uh, then we're going to engage a bit with uh, what was really an excellent, excellent film uh, from Matt Walsh and the Daily Wire, What is a Woman? So we're going to
going to talk about the good. We're going to talk about some of the things that were a little shaky in terms of foundation and uh, stuff that relates to the gospel, to the biblical worldview. I'm going to engage a bit with uh, some of Matt Walsh's uh, response to some of the complaints of people saying, great film, but you totally left out really the foundation that mm. ma- that can make any real sense or justification of what you're trying to do here. So we're going to get to that as well. Love the film. I think it was a, a part of how God tells you to argue in Proverbs. Uh, we're going to talk about that in terms of, uh, I'll just give it to you. It says in Proverbs, it says, don't answer the fool according to their folly, lest you be like unto them. And then it says, answer the fool according to their folly, lest they be wise in their own conceit. I think Matt Walsh did a fantastic job of following what is biblical wisdom in terms of how to argue in in the way that he was able to sort of show the absurdity by stepping into their worldview and showing them their feet, but he left out the part where you're not supposed to answer the cool accor- the fool according to their the cool the cool the, the, the fool according to their folly, or you'll be like them. If you pretend neutrality like them, if you leave God and His authority out of it, His self attesting authority, then you're going to be like the fool. You'll be on similar shaky ground. But before we get to what uh, we hope turns out to be a really really uh, beneficial show for you, um, I want to talk a bit about. What is coming up this year? Reform Con 2022. I can't believe that I'm saying that. It's already 2022. But Reform Con 2022 is going to be Reformation Day weekend here in Arizona. Uh, we have a great venue. It is going to be a blast. This is a Christian conference. I want to stress that because I already anticipate the complaints that are going to be coming after the conference in terms of you know, uh, performances and things like that. This isn't a church service. No. It's a Christian conference. It's Reform Con. The title of the the conference is uh, By This Standard, and uh, we're going to talk about how we use the Word of God to transform the world and to um, increase and spread Christ's glory, His gospel, His supremacy, and His dominion into every area of life, whether that is the arts, whether that's economics, whether that's education, whatever it may be, Christ is Lord there. And so as Christians, we want to do what our predecessors have done in the past, and that's excel, bring glory to God in every area of life, whether it is education, the sciences, the arts, whatever it may be, Christians were running that stuff long before we we sort of handed over the culture to the world and pretended neutrality. So reformcon.org, get your tickets because we got a great venue it's not like some people hold conferences that we know where it's like, you know, in a horse stable where yeah. you can't see anything and you can't even see the screens or see the speakers and, you know, they treat you like cattle. They treat you like cattle. Some plus, conferences. Plus, I've also heard you get extra reformed points if you go to a conference on Reformation. That's true. Right? It's extra. On that actual It's weekend. bonus. That's absolutely it's true. It's bonus. So for those of you keeping track of your points. Beards. <laughs> point. Reformation Day weekend, points, right? Oh, I mean, yeah. It, it works. I, I, I totally see it. Excellent. But um, we got a great venue. The problem is, with a great venue like this in the Valley of the where we're at, um, we have limited seating. Yes. And so we only have so many seats. If you don't get your tickets, we run out of seats. There is just nothing we can do. We can't increase any space. We can't move anything around. It is just what it is, as tight as it is. And so if you want to come, we'd love you to come join us. We're going to have fellowship. We're going to have an after party. We're going to have performances. Yes, performances. We've got a professional baseball player. We've got uh, David Bonson, who is uh, world-renowned. Uh, for his expertise in the area of economics. He's on Fox News all the time, a bunch of different platforms. Uh, He's going to be talking there, doing uh, stuff. We're going to have our art performance and those sorts of things. I'm actually putting, dusting off the gi, coming and doing a performance. Uh, We're going to talk about, like, one thing Andrew Sandlin said that I think is sort of like the highlight of what I want to sort of express. You and I have talked about this Mm -hmm. a lot. At ReformCon, as we talk about by this standard, is that all of life is worship. And so we played a clip once of Andrew, Andrew Salen talking for us uh, about a minute long, talking about how one of the things the Reformation did is the Reformation took away the idea that, that Roman Catholicism had started to exalt and promote. And then like the real spiritual stuff takes place in that building and that priest, right. he's really spiritual. Right. Like that's the high spiritual work there. Everything else there, everything out there in the world that's, you know, eh, whatever. Is God really concerned with that? No, all of life is worship. And so he said something I think probably shocked people there. He said, you should 
you should play professional basketball for the glory of God. Amen. That's worship. And uh, all of life is worship. Owning a business, running a business is worship. Um, you know, whether you're, a, 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 you're owning a laundromat, do it for the glory of God. Do it as worship. Um, and so we're going to do that. We're going to do it in so many different areas. We've got live performances. We've got after parties. We've got great teaching. Who's coming to teach? Uh, you. Yes. Um, Dr. James White, Joe Boot, Toby Sumter, John Sampson, David Bonson, um, did I say Andrew Sandlin? No. Okay, Andrew Sandlin. Um, I think you automatically add like 25 points too because we have a Bonson yes. there, right? That's also That's, true. Yeah. We have, we have a Bonson. That is yeah. also mm-hmm. very so, true. Yeah. And we just, we can now officially announce that Ben Merkel is also teaching for us. Oh, nice. And he'll be doing education. Um, and I f- feel like I'm forgetting somebody. We've got but, different podcasts showing up. Uh, yep. And we've got uh, space available right now for sponsors, people who want yep. to come and get a get a booth. Uh, just so you know, again, great venue, limited space. So we don't actually have a lot of sponsorship stuff to give right. away and, and people to get booths there. So if you have a, a, a business you want to promote, um, you know, you're excelling in your area and your field for the glory of God, you've got to get it soon. So they yep. need to go to... Yeah, so you can go to reformcon.org, and uh, obviously we got the f- go there for the tickets. We got family pricing. We have um, – this is actually really cool. It, hotel prices right now are, like, through the roof because mm-hmm. of everything. Yeah. And thank you, Sleepy Joe. Um, not ours. Not for reformcon because we have uh, prices locked in before all the stuff mm-hmm. started raising up. So we have – you can get your rooms there at the hotel. Um, we're, we have a ton of sponsorship opportunities um, f- whether it be exhibitor booths, whether it be T-shirts, water bottles, all kinds of stuff, so you can go and get your. Um, if you want, if you're interested in that, you can do that. Plus, like Jeff said, we have um, we're going to have a number of podcast booths available as well. We have podcast row; it's going to be separate from the exhibitors hall. Um, and the really cool thing that we haven't really talked a lot about is the after party, which you mentioned. So the after the opening night, we're going to have a special. Uh, ticket for the after party it's gonna be just a chance to hang out with us and it will include at least we're still working on this at least one drink token possibly two um part of that part of the package for apple juice yeah if you want apple juice apple juice (laughs) apple juice amen Uh, happy juice (laughs) happy juice um yeah so so. reformcon.org yep that's where people get hooked up get tickets get them as soon as you can uh, man, gas prices, dude. Oh, it's I insane. just left my house today. Quick trip in front of my house. Uh, five fifty nine for gas. Five yeah, when we Ooh. when we left for Oklahoma, which was a few weeks ago, we paid four eighty when we left the valley. The whole time when we were in Oklahoma, we paid a dollar less. Yeah, yeah, that's um, way cheaper in Salt Lake. And too. then uh, by the time we got back, it was like five fifteen. Mm-hmm. That means it went up. Like yeah. over thirty cents yeah. in two weeks, oh. in not even a full two weeks. Like yeah. that's insane. Yeah, people are saying uh, to be looking towards August for the the massive mm. spike. Massive. Um, so I'm thinking, well, what? It's not massive yet. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, Joe Biden did say in one of the debates that we would be like carbon emission free by 2025. So maybe this is part of the plan. It's part of his <laughs> goal. <laughs> Mims, you're about it, to get blocked, son. Mims. <laughs> Mims like you're talking junk. Sorry. Continue. Um, all right. So that's it, guys. Reformcon.org. Make sure you get your tickets. We're looking forward to seeing you guys all out there. It's going to just be a great time. Again, Christian Conference, we're hoping to do like no other. We're hoping that you don't just have to sit there for, you know, two days and just get, you know, hour after hour after hour after deep, 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 hard pounded truth. Uh, I've been to conferences like that where by the middle of the day you're just exhausted. You haven't had a chance to digest any of it or to fellowship and enjoy really your time. We want to make sure that this is an enjoyable experience where you're getting solid, really great teaching, stuff that will transform your lives. And also at the same time, get some Christian entertainment and uh, enjoy one another's fellowship. And so that's what's up. Reformcon.org. And before we get into it, quick thing, you want to do something like this? Yes, so I brought my, my dump pouch today. Now, you weren't on this episode, but Joy was on it with, I forget who we had on, but remember we talked about how many sandwiches can we fit in a dump? Oh, yeah. So, that looks like my husband's foraging bag. I brought a box of Uncrustables. Oh. <laughs> so this is my AR500 dump pouch, by the Very way. Very nice. Uh, clearly, I haven't put it on my 
battle belt yet, but we're going to see how many Uncrustables we can fit in here. Let's see how many there's 10 in here. By the way, no high fructose corn syrup in there. Oh, nice. Let's, I think I can at least get all 10 of these in here. Um, yeah. So if you don't use this for empty mags, you can just, you know, fill it with Next week, Luke's going to bring in um, some Italian grinders and see how many hoagies you can fit in there. Now so we're, now we're talking. Ten full Uncrustables. And uh, one more. <laughs> next week. What's that called? A boogie else. pouch? Uh, dump pouch. Dump pouch. Your empty mags. Look at that. With room to spare. You can get this at AR500. <laughs> uh, ArmoredRepublic.com. Tool of Liberty right here. And sandwiches. That's right. And sandwich carry. Tools of Liberty and one. sandwich. <laughs> sandwich. <laughs> Hold your sandwiches. <laughs> All right, so here we go. It, listen, uh, as we start the show today, uh, foundational stuff here. I started the show with a verse. It wasn't just let's find a verse and start the show off with any verse, any old verse. No, that verse has some very, very significant meaning, and it is really foundational. And I think when you sometimes approach a section of Scripture like this, maybe you know it very well, it is actually a very popular verse, and I think it's that way for a reason. It's foundational for much of what's in the Bible, but in particular the book of Proverbs. If you read the book of Proverbs, Proverbs 1-7 is the foundation and explanation of the entire book. Everything in Proverbs, God's book of wisdom, skillful living, goes back to Proverbs 1-7, and it says the fear of Yahweh, the fear of not just any God, but the fear of the true God, Yahweh, um, is the beginning of knowledge. Now, it's easy to miss the significance of that because it is such a powerful, bold statement. It's one of those things that could just become sort of this, you know, uh, pithy spiritual platitude, right, that really has no significance like in the area of science and medicine and logic and mathematics. It's just something you put on, as I often say, a coffee mug, and it's just one of those good Christian pithy slogans. No, really for the book of Proverbs and really for the entire Bible, that's it. The fear of Yahweh, the fear of the Lord, is the beginning of -hmm. knowledge. Not the middle, not the end of knowledge. It is the beginning of knowledge. That's a bold statement. That's to say that if you don't start your thinking with reverent submission, awe before God, fear of God, you haven't even started knowledge. Now, it's not to say that unbelievers who don't fear God don't have brute facts about the world. They don't have the image of God. Like, it's not gone. It's not a race because they're at war with God, and so they just walk around, you know, like zombies and like orcs. No, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. That is to say that the very grounding and foundation, the starting point of knowing anything at all, starts with fear of God. And again, in God's world, with God's image bearers, everyone's an image bearer of God. You can't escape it. If you're human, you're an image bearer of God. You're not going to be able to escape living in God's world and knowing things. But those knowing things won't be attached to anything. They'll be suspended in midair. Like, people make knowledge claims all the time. Mm-hmm. People make knowledge claims all the time. We're going to talk about today, like, you know, Matt Walsh's excellent film, What is a Woman? Um, people are claiming things. He's got, he's got like, these people who do gender assignment surgeries or reassignment surgeries you've got all kinds of you know whacked out uh leftist teachers who are making knowledge claims they're claiming to know things i know this this is what ought to be done this is true this is not true and yet one of the things he does such a great job a masterful job of pointing out walsh does is showing the inconsistency of their position their their position is hung on nothing and it's internally inconsistent and incoherent Most of it is all self-refuting, but they're still making knowledge claims. They're Mm -hmm. saying things that are true. And, you know, you can have the unbeliever that drives down a road at at 45 miles per hour and, uh, you know, comes across something, an obstacle in front of them, and they know if I don't get out of the way or stop, I'm going to crash into that object. Like, they understand the laws of physics is my point, right? Like, I'm proceeding forward on this path. I'm going 45 miles per hour. There's an object in my path. I'm going to have to stop or get around it, or I'm going to come into collision with that. They know that because they live in God's world, and so that's inescapable. But even in that claim, I'm going 45 miles per hour. There's an object in front of me. If I continue on this path, I'm going to run into it, so I have to stop or move around it. If they don't have God, there's no real, coherent justification for what they know and how they're going to proceed from there. What do I mean by that? 
Well, if, if you have sitting behind the wheel of that car somebody like, say, a Richard Dawkins who believes that human beings are just African apes, that we're just stardust, that this universe is just chaos, time and chance, acting on matter, you know, all of that. If you believe that, well, then Bertrand Russell, famous atheist in history, and David Hume, the famous uh, Scottish skeptic, would tell you, well, we need an answer for the problem of induction, the principle of induction. We need an answer for the uniformity in nature. Like, what, on what basis should I proceed in this world on the assumption that future, um, um, future situations, experiences, are going to be congruent with past situations? Mm -hmm. In other words, the future will be like the past, like the laws of gravity, like the laws of, of motion and objects and speed, all of that. Who says that's going to be consistent five seconds from now? If this universe is time and chance acting on matter and there is no governance, there is no holding all of this together, then we don't have any basis for science, which is why, and you've heard us say this a bajillion times, if that's <laughs> even a word. That's a lot. You've heard us say this so many times, which is why um, if you do not have a basis, a grounding for the problem of induction, then you don't have science, which is why the Christian worldview is what gave modern science its pop. It's also why Richard Dawkins has to, when he was going to teach in, in university, he would have to walk under a precipice that said, um, in his light we see light, or, or it was wonderful are the works of the Lord, or something like that. Because like he has essentially co-opted the Christian worldview and its benefits. He's borrowing capital to do what he does with science, but he wants to ignore the foundation which is the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And so the point is, when we start this discussion off, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. If you don't start with fear of God, there is no real knowledge. Yeah, you'll know some brute facts. You'll know some things. Sometimes you may be a better mathematician as an atheist than some Christians are. Better than me anyways. Not my area. But you won't have a justification for what you're doing because you don't fear God. And Paul says in Colossians chapter 1, in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. If you want knowledge, if you want understanding, it is in Christ. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth. He is truth incarnate. All that to say, we're going to play some stuff that's going to set your hair on fire. <laughs> this discussion we've been having recently of homeschooling, we've always had it. Yeah. But this, this issue of homeschooling, praise God for this massive exodus out of the public school system and the government education system into private Christian schooling and into homeschooling. Praise God for that. I think we would have been so grateful 10 years ago to know that this is where we'd be. Because when we first started oh, having yeah. this discussion, remember how, remember how we were like, well, like people were going to hate us yeah. for saying this. Like, mm. you know, we're really going to have to ease our way into this conversation because there's a lot of Christians that are going to come, you yeah. know, gnashing their teeth at us. Mm -hmm. and, and some did. Some really did. But here we are now, 2022, especially after COVID. I was say, thank you, COVID. Thank you, COVID, right? Uh, where people are going, hey, wait a tick. This is actually not good. And it's only gotten worse with the indoctrination and the leftist propaganda and the unbelieving worldview that's being crammed down my child's throat. And now it's just so applauded. It's so celebrated. And so we're going to talk about uh, homeschool, education. It's all going to blend into the discussion with Matt Walsh. Uh, but I'll shut up for a moment and let you guys add. Anything. Well, I... I just was going to say, I, before we get too far into this, I, I, I didn't get a chance to watch the whole film I'm about uh, three-fifths of the way through it. It was interesting to see, you know, obviously how much of this conversation has to do with government schools <laughs> and our, you know, state colleges and universities and just the nonsense going on there. And um, Well, that's where it begins. Yeah, exactly. Um I didn't. I don't know why. For some reason, I didn't anticipate it going that direction, but I should have. Um, uh, but the thing that I thought most interesting about this film was just every time he pressed one of these liberal whack jobs um, on what is truth, they literally were like, "Oh, I think we're done here. I think this conversation's over." Mm -hmm. Every single time, and it was like, "Wow!" Not one person wants to answer that question. Well, I think this will get okay. We're gonna we're gonna jump ahead a second here. Yeah. I know, I'm glad I'm you point. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm actually you didn't, but I'm, I'm glad you brought that point up. When he brought up the issue of truth yeah. to that one person, they immediately like shut down. Like this interview is going to be over. Yeah. Like because he just, I just want to talk about truth. Yeah. So like one you asked the, the question, what use the word? He used the words invoke the word. The truth. word invoke the word truth. 
<laughs> I was like, oh my, oh my goodness. Right. Like, so you do acknowledge yeah. that there is power Don't of some kind to me about behind that. <laughs> well, no, okay, this gets to an important point, and it gets to the issue of education, and it does relate to homeschool and to Matt Walsh's video. I'm glad you brought that up. When that, issue, when that point came up in the film, like, what is truth, and this person got offended by the question, here's the point. When we start to do a little bit of a critique of Matt Walsh's position in this and how he brings this across is that even Matt Walsh's position needs to be challenged there as well. Yeah, yeah. You don't get to do that just to the, to the fool, Yeah. right? Like, it, it, it should be a question that comes right back to you. Like if you're if you're right. allowed to ask right. the fool, which is how the Bible will describe it, the, mm-hmm. the 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 simpleton, the sc- the fool, the scoffer, you know, Proverbs chapter one, it's it's all over there. The gullible. Um, if you're allowed to ask them what is truth, and you can laugh as their as their house falls completely apart, which is what everyone does at that point in the film, it has to also come back to you. What is truth? Yeah. Matt Walsh needs to answer that question. I need to answer that right. question. You need to answer that question. And the point is, is if you don't have fear of God as the beginning of knowledge, if you don't have Christ, Christ says you're either with me or you're against me, there's no neutrality with Jesus, then even you don't have a basis for truth. Like, yeah, you might point to observational things and say, wow, look, this tribe over here in Africa, they've been totally not influenced by Western nonsense over the last generation, and they scoff, rightfully, at the fact that Western education, academia, and media has taught the, our children that they can pretend to be a woman, you can laugh at that all you want, but that's observational. You're saying, oh, there's a tribe over here that still recognizes the male-female distinction, and that, mm-hmm. you know, this stuff is, like, deep down. It's, it's, who, it's who we are. It's, we're created this way, male, female. We have certain, you know, gender identities uh, that are just part of creation, the creational norm and certain roles and functions of male and female. But here's the problem. If you refuse to start your thinking with Christ and standing on the foundation of the authoritative word of God, then you will also crumble because all you've got is one tribe arguing with another tribe about what ought to be the case. And if this is just a blind and pitiless Mm -hmm. indifferent universe, then all you've got is one tribe's opinion over another. And then ultimately, who cares? I mean... If it works for them, who cares? I mean, is there, any, is there really any transcendent moral ought hovering over every tribe's head? Because I agree with Matt Walsh and everything he was trying to do in the film, but it was suspended in midair. Yeah. It was suspended in midair. Well, I mean, and again, without going to let you guys too far converse this. for a second, small bladder problems. Okay, so yeah. Feel free. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I mean, I, I love Matt Walsh. I love a lot what he has to say. And obviously, you're paying attention to the comment thread today. This has already come up, but Matt Walsh is Roman Catholic. Right. Um, and so I know that's where Jeff was headed there. So I don't want to get too far into the conversation, but Matt Walsh is Roman Catholic. Um, he, I'm sure he's a fan of Aquinas. I'm sh- and as as we've you've seen in this film, he very much relies on, you know, natural law and not necessarily minus reformed points for being a fan of Aquinas. Definitely, <laughs> definitely minus reformed points, big time. <laughs> Um, you know, so he's going to rely more on that, uh, in creation, um, than, than it being simply just God's standard, God's word as our presupposition. So, right. Yeah, I do. Um, something that kind of comes to mind, uh, so we can wait to talk about the Roman Catholic part of it until Jeff comes back. Um, we're actually reading, Sheologian's book club is reading total truth right now by Nancy Piercy. Mm hmm. Um, and obviously Francis Schaeffer is pretty much like the big worldview philosophy Christian guy. And she is a student of his. Um, oh, and I did one not of the, that. yeah, one of the things that she has brought up, um, she actually brought up in multiple books that she's written. Uh, and I've heard her talk about it in a few different interviews, but it's the idea that we, um, she said one of the short, f- like one of the, like kind of where the, uh, Christianity falls short at dealing with a lot of these issues is that we're like attacking them individually. Mm-hmm. And obviously she's a huge like Christian worldview mm-hmm. proponent. And so that this just, this shows the inconsistency uh, in just going after these little um, topics like yeah. being transgender. What is a woman? That's just one. Um, that's just one way that we're messed up in our culture. Yeah. 
And so she basically is saying that a mistake we make is separating all those little things when it's all one big yeah. worldview issue, just yeah. like uh, we would say that being a Roman Catholic is also, there are, that's a worldview yeah, position. Mm-hmm. Yeah, how a person um, is justified before God, yeah. how right. they're saved, how they're reconciled before God, the authority of Scripture. You're bringing up the issue of natural theology before I left, yeah. and that's Roman Catholicism, yeah. mm-hmm. uh, Thomas Aquinas. All of that is natural theology, and natural theology in and of itself, apart from special revelation, in a fallen world with rebel sinners, is insufficient right. in itself. Because what do sinners do? What do rebellious, sinful image bearers of God do with the natural revelation that gets through. What do they do with it? Romans chapter 1. They suppress it. Yep. And so, you know, you can show all the tribes you want and all of the history of humanity, showing male-female distinctions, uh, father roles, mother roles, and say, that's the way That's the way. clearly God made the world. And the answer would be, yeah, that's true. The problem is sinful suppression of truth, is that you're right. talking to people who are at war with their creator, which is the fundamental yeah. issue. And the problem is, uh, I would say the problem with uh i i love matt walsh's commentary at times i love you know ben shapiro he he needs christ i want i'd love to debate him over the issue of whether jesus is the messiah i'd love to have that discussion with him a loving uh you know respectful good conversation the problem is this christless conservatism it's a christless conservatism Mm -hmm. it's a conservatism that loves uh some of the benefits that we get from the wisdom of the word of god it loves the benefits it sees that you know the world can't function without the family it can't. It doesn't function right without the father, yeah. without the mother. It can't function. You need to have children. It needs to work a certain way. The world works a certain way because it's God's world. Mm-hmm. It's, how he, it's, 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 in the, it's in the design. It's in the machine itself. It's how it's supposed to work. No one pours sugar into the gas tank unless they don't expect to go anywhere, right? You, go against the, you can go against the machine all you want. It's eventually going to break down. With these uh, gas prices. We, we might, might be pouring sugar. Start. Finding new ways to run the car. Maybe sugar's a thing. Um, the, the, They've been telling us not to do it for years. Maybe that's why. <laughs> that's the thing. It's free. It's free. Um, uh, I mean, ethanol's kind of like sugar. It so. could be. I mean. We might be onto something. Let's figure yeah. it out. Uh, we might have to have to figure uh, it out. Just so you know, nobody, please nobody. <laughs> Don't do that. Don't no. do that. Um, he did not tell you to do that. <laughs> that's right. Um, disclaimer. <laughs> so um, it's it's a Christless conservatism. It's the, it's wanting the benefit of what God's wor- word gives you, but it's refusing to acknowledge His authority over yeah, those truths. Exactly. Right. That will not work. And if you listen, here's the problem: if you had the entire country finally say, "Yeah, gender distinctions are a real thing. Gender roles are a real thing. That's built into the system. That should be seen as innate. We understand that." If you get the whole world to agree with that, you've still got a nation full of people who are not reconciled to God, people who need Jesus Christ. That's the main issue. So if Matt Walsh does a great job, and he does, of showing the absurdity yes. of these positions, if everybody adopts it and they say, got it, bite down, then what? you still got a nation full of people who need to be reconciled to God and have peace with God. That's ultimate. And I can't accept the answer, yeah, maybe we'll get there with them down the line. That's not how Jesus talked. Right. That's not how he taught. In his ministry wasn't like, let, let me just give you a little bit at a time, and then maybe someday you'll give me a shot. That's not how he does. He comes into the world, turns to huge crowds of people, and he dwindles them down to nothing, saying, if anyone comes to me and does not hate, and he names your favorite people, and he says, and even your own life, you're not worthy to be my disciple. And he says, if you're not with me, you are against me. Like it or not, that's the message of Jesus. Mm. Like it or not. That's the message of Jesus. That might seem um, too aggressive to some. I'm sorry. Jesus says that his words were truth, that he is the life, and we need to follow him. And that's and if we don't have him, the wrath of God abides in us. Yes. That's what the Bible says. And so everyone's main issue is not their genitals. It's not the sexual choices that they're making. Not it, Their main issue is they need peace with God. And that's only available through faith in Christ and through him alone. And so that's the problem, a Christless conservatism. And so... One good thing to talk when we talk about homeschooling and getting your children out of government schools as soon as possible, um, one of the, the, the issues is um, the problem of the myth of neutrality. We have gone about government and education in a way that Christians historically would have scoffed at. The idea that you can somehow educate children 
and do it apart from the authority of Christ or apart from the biblical worldview. We can just approach the whole thing with neutrality. It's impossible. Neutrality is a myth. Mm. And one of the things that you're seeing a lot lately is, um, is just how obvious it is. And um, let me do this. We've got a couple of clips here. We're not going to spend too much time on this today, but I think there's some beneficial ones. Um, you know, I've told a story about when I was convicted and challenged after reading a, a book for seminary, Always Ready by Greg Bonson. If you don't have it, sell your shirt and shoes and buy the book, Always Ready. Read it, digest it, understand it. It's very important. But I got really challenged because I was so opposed to Christian schooling and homeschooling. I, mean, I was militant uh, in opposition. And uh, I read that book, was totally challenged. Knowledge isn't really possible apart from Christ. Uh, you can't justify it. And man, what are, they, what are they doing to my kids in this school? Yeah. So I started thinking these hard thoughts. And then my kids are coming home saying, hey, we read a uh, book in class. Heather has two mommies, I think is what it was called. And then I was asked to do an art masterpiece class with uh, my daughter's class, just like a parent assistance thing for art. And uh, when I went to pick up the materials to teach the curriculum for this art class, it was all evolution. Mm -hmm. It was all like, you know, we evolved from lower bacteria and then moved up the chain and people were in caves and they were like, doot, 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 and drawing into walls sort of a thing. Like, you know, and uh, that's why we have plithographs. Not like us now. Yeah, right, yeah. That are painting dots on canvases and hanging them in. yeah. In museums. Yeah, or dropping uh, balloons filled with yeah. uh, paint out of their mm -hmm. vaginas onto yeah. Yeah. canvases mm -hmm. um, in New York. Um, yeah, but exactly. That's, we haven't gone very we haven't gone very far, have we? Uh, but that, that's what it taught. And so I, I knew then, I was like, this is not neutral. I mean, this is an art class for preschoolers or, or sorry, kindergartners. And look what is, they're doing. They're indoctrinating immediately. And I took over the class, by the way, and taught a creation worldview and... Uh, demonstrated that that curriculum was wrong and the teacher loved it, but um, she wasn't able to teach that. I was because I was the assistant that day. And so at any rate, um, you know, moving forward, for, uh, for me, it's been about 17 years, somewhere around there, 15, 17 years of homeschooling, I think. Um, and it's only gotten worse. Oh, yeah. And it's only gotten... <laughs> To the, to the place where it is so overt and so in your face, I'm so thankful Christians can't deny it anymore. Like, you just can't. Yeah. You can't deny it. Let me give you an example. Here's a teacher. Um, uh, there's a bunch of these on TikTok. I hate TikTok, by the way. Um, but... Um, yeah, if you want to... Uh, if we're, Since we're having a discussion about public schooling, I feel like it is important... That um, public schooling, I think, used to be the primary place where your kids could be indoctrinated, um, specifically into issues of sexuality, mm. like we're talking about later in the show. Um, but there's some pretty strong research and statistics that say that uh, TikTok may have, <laughs> at least for certain age groups, has bumped public schooling mm -hmm. <laughs> um, in terms of indoctrination out of that first uh, first place spot. Um, TikTok is huge, hugely influential for especially young kids between certain ages. I mean, even up till 25. So we're not even talking about kids anymore. And demonstrably bad for your brain. Right. Yeah, the human minds weren't uh, built to have this many fast changes of context oh, yeah. all the time. And, uh, you know, there's issues uh, that are demonstrable in terms of the neuroscience that goes along with some of these these things there's issues related to like people's attention spans and mm -hmm. you know ability to think long hard thoughts consistent thoughts and to really be mm. engaged with something right. for a long period of time uh we're just destroying that with with some of these things all that look I'm, all that to say i hate tiktok um but there's a lot of these lgbt teachers and leftist teachers libs on tiktok that um are just open and clear and excited about what they're doing to your kids. So get your kids out. Um, here is one example. Story time. This has been my first year in preschool with a class of my own, teaching alongside another queer neurodivergent educator. And we have been rocking our twos class. We've been talking about gender and skin color and consent and empathy and oh. our bodies and autonomy. It's been fabulous. But our teaching team is shifting and a new person is being onboarded, someone with many years of experience. So today at the lunch table, when the topic of gender and genitals came up, one of our students 
plainly looked up and said, Well, I'm a girl today, but I know that Teacher Ko isn't. No, they're Enby. And the look on the incoming teacher's face was priceless. She was shocked in a good way. And she just looked around at the two of us and said, this class is incredible. And I am so impressed. Oh, consent with preschool. Goodness gracious. I know it's just one of the I'm just saying that... I'm just saying there used to be a word for people that uh would bring up sexual situations with young children. Mhm. Mhm. Groomers. There used to be a word for that. Pedophiles, groomers. It used to be considered I don't even know like what the technical definition anymore, but it used to be considered sexual abuse for you to bring up topics. Mm-hmm. Yeah. To children of this age. Right. Right. Exactly. And that, sorry, as I bring that, that brings up this book that I was. I mean, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but if you guys haven't seen this, it's called "It's Perfectly Normal," and this has come up a lot recently because there's been different teachers trying to use this book, like for I think it was like kindergartners or like really young kids. Okay, and it's been being banned from different school systems. But I mean, it's literally like it's basically like cartoon drawings of sexual stuff. It's basically porn. Um, and it's, it's called, it's perfectly normal and it's, it's awful. And that's exactly what this is only like in detail. And you're trying to teach it to little kids. It's just, yeah, it's, it's, I, so the, I'm it, angry. It, it, more, more evidence that there is no neutrality. It is a myth. Embrace it. I mean, you can't get clearer than Jesus Christ, God incarnate, saying you're either with me or you are against me. There's no middle ground with Jesus. And so you're either submitted to him and his authority. You're either united to him by faith or you're not. And, you know, we could we could go for days on this discussion. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. In Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You cannot educate apart from Christ in any justifiable, meaningful way. Everything will be suspended in mid-air. Yes, you can give someone a brute fact, but there is no understanding, no knowledge, no wisdom. And believe me, there is ample evidence that these teachers are teaching your children what the government educational system wants them to right. teach them. Right. Is, it, is it obvious to us at all that all of this perversion, all of this brokenness, all of this confusion is coming out of the West? It's coming from our education system. It's coming from academia, coming from us. I mean, Matt Walsh does a great job going to this faraway land, showing this tribe that's totally disconnected, and it's like they don't have any confusion about these things at all. Where's it coming from? He's right. Matt Walsh was right. It's coming from the West. Mm -hmm. We're pumping this stuff out to the world. Where's it coming from? It's not just coming from media. That, that, I think that's an appendage. The media aspect, aspect is an appendage. It's coming from a heart. Right, it's coming from like a core system that's feeding that media stuff. That's yeah. but it's coming from education. Our kids are being taught in school that you are an evolved um, African ape. You are just stardust. You are meaningless protoplasm in a universe that doesn't care about you. The decisions you make with your genitals are your decisions. You can do what you please. There's no moral odds above anybody. And you know if you don't like your genitals, you don't like your gender. Just say that you're something else just pretend like you're something else which is powerfully displayed uh i'll just go ahead and jump ahead to it right here and we'll play some more of the of the tiktok stuff more uh, it's it's displayed powerfully here uh where do you think this came from where where's the genesis of this kind of thinking here this is from what is a woman matt walsh uh revisits his interview with a trans wolf on youtube yeah i am a 27 year old transgender woman um, I am a wolf theory and, and a member of the furry fandom. When and how did you discover this inner wolfness? Um, probably around age 10 or 11. I was watching an anime about wolves and see the wolf running across the screen and I'm somehow just intrinsically like, oh, that's me. And have you spent any time around biological wolves? Yes. That sounds dangerous also. What, what context um, are you? So I was a volunteer with a preserve, and I've, I've also visited many wolf preserves. Are you able to communicate with the wolves? Am I going to have a conversation with a wolf in the way that I'm communicating you and I? Obviously not. Am I going to read their body language, respond appropriately to their behaviors and their nonverbal cues? Yes. 
Would you be would you be able to give us an example of this wolf communication? Um, no, I'm not comfortable doing so. Okay, all right. Uh, because he is in God's image, and he's ashamed. Yeah, no, that's a great point. <laughs> because it, it, he he wants to live it out clearly. Want, I mean, obviously, he wants to live it out. He's bragging about it. But even even there, at least for him now, there's limits to his rebellion and to the mm-hmm. shame that comes from that kind of absurd thinking. But my point in showing that is, where do we think that came from? Where? Where do you think it came from? It came from a society and a culture that accepts it. And the place where that acceptance begins is in these government indoctrination centers, yeah. which is really what they are. Uh, government education, it, it was said, and we said this last time, last show I think we, we said this, uh, government education, public education system um, is actually new, in uh, newer in American history. Before that, it was, uh, education was all Christian. Uh, right. It was private. It was family, churches. It was communities. It was, and it was done very well. And a uh, matter of fact, I challenge you, look at the statistics when education was the way we had it as a Christian church. Look at the statistics of how well we were doing in terms of literacy and all of that. I mean, some of the greatest heavy hitters in American history came from homeschooling from private education. My, my uh, great, 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 great grandfather, uh, 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 he, was, um, he was a chaplain over Congress. Um, he did some amazing things. Um, he was actually an old school Methodist preacher, uh, defended the Trinity publicly, all kinds of really great stuff. Um, but he, his father died when he was 13 years old. All of his brothers and sisters and him were homeschooled. By the time he was 18 years old, he had taught himself Latin, Greek, and Hebrew. Wow. Latin, Greek, and Hebrew, homeschooled. Um, and uh, went to college, started college, already knowing the biblical languages. Um, mm-hmm. and, and that was all homeschool education. So uh, people say, oh, homeschooled, you're going to get this abysmal education. It's like we were doing fine. And back then, pastors warned, they're on record, warning the culture. If you give education over to the state, it's the fast track to atheism and unbelief and the destruction of our nation. And they were right. They were right. And so get your kids out of public education as soon as you can. Let me give you one more here. This is um, uh, on YouTube, uh, Libs of TikTok cringe compilation number two. This is uh, about four minutes into it, uh, but I, I saw this. I wanted you guys to see this too. I just added bug to my list of pronouns. So here is a very quick tutorial on how to use bug bugs pronouns in sentences. Okay, let's go. I'm meeting up with my friend Moth later. Uh, bug just dyed Bug's hair and it's this super cool green color right now. I think we're gonna go to Bug's house and play some video games. And then I think Bug said that Bug wanted to go to the store by Bug's self. So I'm gonna head out after that and then maybe we'll get to hang out another time. I love hanging out with Moth. Bug is a super cool friend and I'm so glad that Bug hangs out with me. (laughs) I <laughs> so yeah, if you guys have any questions, um, that is how you use bug, bug, bug self pronouns. Uh, and I'm always willing to answer questions about my pronouns. The absurdity is just absurd. I don't know what else to say to it's, that. It's like, it's like you're watching a, uh, an apocalyptic film. Yeah. About like, a, like the Twilight a, a Zone. culture and society that completely crumbles in upon itself. Yeah. And some of it at times doesn't even seem real. But the point is, and you can see this in, in Romans chapter one, when the Apostle Paul explains how God is so clearly known to everybody that he makes himself known to everyone so that yeah. they, so much so that they are without a defense, without an apology. With uh, on apologetus, without an apologia, without a reason defense f- for themselves, um, and then he explains that it goes into people actually um, uh, flipping the order of creation itself. On top of it, it, we don't want God in our knowledge, and so what we do is we exchange the true God for a false God. And then he starts going into issues of human sexuality, and then he goes into other things like disobedient to parents, enemies of God, all that stuff. And it says that not they don't just know that they deserve judgment, 
for these things, but they give hearty approval. They applaud those who do them. And when you get to a place in a culture and society where you can say these sorts of things and say them proudly, loudly, in the public square, which is what TikTok and social media really is. It's the public square. It's the marketplace of ideas. When you can do that and be proud of yourself, you've gotten to a place where everybody's applauding you for what you're doing. It is just uh, depravity on full display. It is darkness Mm -hmm. overwhelming the culture and society, but it begins somewhere. Where does it begin? It begins with education. It begins with very, very moldable minds. Children delivered over to a system to be discipled for hours and hours a day, five days a week for all of their young life. And that's where this acceptance comes from. Um, that's, that's where it begins. They're being indoctrinated. And let's be honest, when you see something like this, when you see something like this, um, it, it is the end result of a lot of people who have been prepped and molded to accept it. That's where we're at now. And it began somewhere. The world has done a better job of discipling the children than the Christian church has. Take responsibility. Like, take responsibility. How do we blow it? It's one of the things I really love about uh, our Navy SEAL buddies. Mm. They talk about responsibility. Oh, yeah. And how if something goes wrong on the battlefield, Mm. they have to do an assessment at the end to say, like, what failed tactically? Where did we go wrong? Who has to take responsibility for this? And that's what the one thing they expect is, like, look, you finish an op. You get to the end of it. You have to do something at the very end and assess the whole situation and say, take responsibility. Like, be honest with yourself. Tell yourself the truth. How did you fail? Don't yeah. be prideful. Where, where'd you fail? And whose responsibility is it? Yeah. And so, even in a successful operation, yeah. they still have to, if something went wrong, they still have to own that. That's how so. they're always improving. Yeah. Take responsibility. And so, in this case, we have to say to the Christian church, to us as a community, take responsibility. We failed. Last generation, we failed big time. We failed to press the crown rights of Jesus Christ into the world around us. We, pr- we failed to be bold. We failed to educate our children with godly knowledge and wisdom. It's our fault. And so let's mm-hmm. repent. Let's dust ourselves off. Let's cling to the forgiveness that we have in Christ. And let's do better. Let's, let's take our children back away from these people. Yeah, amen. Yeah, I think that's a huge... That's a big part of it. I think you see a lot in uh, churches and just Christian circles. Today, you see people unwilling to speak truth because it might hurt someone's feelings. But I think even at the very foundation of that, um, in order to tell someone they need to repent, you have to maybe introduce um, unpleasant feelings about the things they've done. And so when you have an entire uh, Christian culture that... Um, is unwilling to say anything that would make someone feel bad about something they've done, Mm. then you're talking about a culture that cannot actually produce any kind of repentance at all because we're un... Well, and you have to even... It goes to the point where you have to even dissolve what's right and what's wrong um, because people shouldn't have to feel bad about choices they've made or whatever. But there's... So there's ultimately no, like, push for any kind of conversion. There's no there were no if there are no mistakes ever made if no one ever made the wrong choice (laughs) then there is no reason for them to turn from those wrong choices um and you you see it happening in churches um and in christian families where people they believe this sort of your truth my truth type of thing um and that is one of the biggest i mean you know, uh, sexuality issues aside, that's one of the biggest exports from the public education system is just truth, worldview yeah. stuff. Yeah. Um, even the ability to know what's right and what's wrong. Um, and yeah, it's led to intense failure. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Big time. Uh, it's funny. I was, I was thinking that we were doing our missions trip to our church plant in Utah. We just got back a couple days ago, uh, two days ago. Right. Um, and, um, on the on the way there, on the way back, it's like well, like eleven and a half hour drive, and so I, I downloaded the audio book of David, David Goggins, the Navy Seal oh, okay. dude. He's he's a beast, and uh, we listened to that uh, pretty pretty much the whole time. And I was thinking of some common grace stuff that he says in, mm. as he opens the book. 
he talks about the accountability mirror. Now, he's not a Christian, right? And uh, but I was thinking that's good common grace there. Is, yeah. It's amazing that he recognizes as an image bearer of God, there's a real failure uh, in terms of not confronting yourself and just saying, I'm wrong. Mm-hmm. And so one of the ways that he brings this out is he was like 300 pounds, over six feet tall. He's a very good looking black man, but at one point he was this really overweight dude that wanted the stars but was like just he he admits it he's like i was stupid i didn't study Mm. i spent my life cheating Mm. um and i I couldn't get ahead in education because i'd always have these excuses for everybody else and he was like i wanted to be a navy seal and he said but the the weight thing for men to go to buds was like 191 i'm 300 pounds and he had a chance to to go to buds but he had three months to get from 300 pounds to 191 and so the whole story goes, basically, he goes to the mirror to himself one day, and he looks at himself, and he just starts telling himself the truth. He just says the truth to himself. Right. He's like, you're dumb. You're dumb yes. because you don't study. That's why you're dumb. Like, you're not educated yeah. because you don't work at it. And he looks at himself, and he's like, and you look like this, not, not because you have to, but because you won't do anything about it. Mm-hmm. And so he, he talks about, like, step one is the accountability mirror is just start telling yourself the truth. Like, you want all these things, and the reason you don't have them is because you're not willing to work for them. Like, you would rather watch TV, you'd rather drink a chocolate milkshake than go actually go after it. And so you'd I was rather thinking, eat a dump pouch full of yeah, yeah, Uncrustables. Yeah, exactly, Uncrustables. <laughs> My point is, is, like, it was really cool to hear someone in his place that has experienced that common grace of just the willingness to say, I'm wrong, I'm wrong. And yeah. so accountability is, 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 is lacking in our world today. When you have the Christian worldview in the atmosphere, people understand there's a standard above all of our heads. All of us are creatures under God. All of us fail. All of us fall short. And so there's a willingness in that kind of environment to say, where do I need to be corrected? Mm-hmm. Like, right. you know, the Proverbs 1-7 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. It says this, fools despise wisdom and correction. Starts with God, fear of God. But fools despise any correction. And man, I preached on that two weeks ago, and I've been thinking a lot to myself, if that doesn't identify the world we're living in today, I don't know what does. It's a single line that is just devastating. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. They don't want to be corrected. They scoff. They mock. Wisdom cries out in the marketplace above everybody, the sea of people. Come, listen to me, listen to me. And they scoff, and they mock, and they hate knowledge. And so Proverbs 1 later says, same chapter there, Proverbs 1 later says that when your day of calamity comes, wisdom is going to laugh at you. Mm. Wisdom will laugh at you, not because of the pain you're in. Wisdom will laugh at you because of the triumph of truth over error. That's how why wisdom laughs, uh, because fools despise it. And when their calamity befalls them, wisdom, a.k.a. God, will ultimately laugh because when he called out, they didn't want it. They didn't want to listen. And so when they're crying out to God, when their calamities in front of them, he says, I won't listen. I'm not going to listen. It's a powerful thing. Proverbs 1. We're gonna, you're going to be getting a lot of Proverbs um, as the years go by because we're doing an exposition of uh, the book of Proverbs verse by verse. Joy, did you want to say something? Looked like you were going to say something. Okay. No, I'm just, okay. you know. I, I, I thought I was, I was almost cutting you off there. No, so. no, no, no. Yeah. All right. So now let's go into, this is a, a famous clip from Dr. Phil with Matt Walsh. Some of this is in the film, What is a Woman? I do highly recommend the film. It is very good. Again, I see some shortcomings, some important shortcomings in terms of how the argument is made. I think it does a great job of answering the fool according to their folly. Um, and um, uh, that's good, but it it, it, it doesn't do the right thing in terms of giving a real foundation. But this is an important clip. This is from the Dr. Phil show. And again, some of this is in the film itself. Well, this is one of the problems with this left-wing gender ideology is that no one who espouses it can even tell you what these words mean. Like, what is a woman? Well, can you tell me what a woman is? No, I can't. Because but, it's not for me to say. I, womanhood looks different for everybody. What do, you, what do you define a woman as? An adult human female. And what does a female mean? Uh, well, well, that's how do you, how do you define a someone with, with female reproductive organs. Okay. Someone who's, you know, here's the thing. When you're, when you're a female, it goes right down to your bones, your DNA. So that's why if someone dies, okay. we could dig up their bones 100 years from now. We have no idea what they believed in their head, but we can tell what sex they were okay. because it's, in, it's, down in, it's, it's ingrained in every fiber of their being. Interesting. So I'm trying to understand. 
Your definition is that a woman is someone who is female, you said, right? Correct, as a biological female. So what happens if we have maybe someone who is female, identifies as a woman, right? You know, cisgender woman, right? As you explained, as you just explained, that maybe doesn't have the ability to reproduce. Maybe doesn't have those organs that you're talking about that are reproductive organs. I have answered the question. You stood up here and said trans women are women. Yes. Tell me what you mean. What is a woman? Womanhood is something that, just as Ethan explained, I cannot define because I am not but myself. you used the well, word. So what did you mean when you said trans women are women if you don't know what it means? Right. So here's the thing. So I do not define what a woman is because I do not identify as a woman. Womanhood is something that is an umbrella term. It includes people that who... That describes what? People who identify as a woman. I- identify as What? as a woman. What is that? Was to each their own. Each woman, each man, each person is going to have a different relation with their own gender identity and define it differently. And so trans women are women too. Okay. And you want to, hold on, hold on. Trans women are women. You you won't even tell me what the word means though. So that's the problem. You want to reduce women, you want to reduce men down to maybe just their genetics, our genitals, our chromosomes, right? That's what you're saying. What what you, what you want to do is appropriate women you want to appropriate womanhood okay. and turn it into basically a costume that could be worn. We've got one. Boom. That was actually really well done. Yeah, it was. And, and that was, that was uh, Proverbs chapter 26, verses 4 and 5. Don't answer the fool according to their folly, lest they be wise in their own conceit. Answer the fool according to their folly. Um, I'm sorry. No, don't answer the fool according to the folly, lest you be like unto them, or you'll be like them. Then answer the fool according to their folly, lest they be wise in their own conceit. That was the second part there. Answering the fool according to their folly. Doing the internal critique. Stepping into their system. Showing you don't even have a definition. You're saying that anyone could be a woman, but you don't even know what a woman is. That stepping into their position, making them look at their feet. That's uh, exposing the internal inconsistencies. Doing the internal critique. That was done very well by Matt Walsh in this film, I think, at, at some good points. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And again, going back, I just, it's mind boggling to me that, like, literally no one wants to answer his question. Nobody wants to well, define what a woman is. Because there is no, <laughs> they don't have an answer. Their right. answer, um, I mean, it's a lo- long story short, philosophically, our culture allows for that answer. That is a legitimate answer in our culture Um, because we believe in basic, we basically believe in personal subjective preference as truth. So it really, it just, every time it just keeps coming back to what is, what is, it's the question is not even what is a woman. The question is what is truth? Mm -hmm. Because honestly that I know it sounds silly, but the non answer that she gave and or he I don't I'm sorry, I don't know. Um <laughs> he, he, he. that was a, he. clearly um, a he. <laughs> um, clearly a he. Yeah, I don't know anymore. Yeah. I mean yeah. I just mean I don't know like what anyone that, is, I mean then again it could maybe it's right. it's maybe that's it's a I woman mean, who's taking like, you know the stuff that's testosterone and she's yeah. I mean I operate in reality, <laughs> not in feelings. Right. So I'm not trying to be uh disrespectful to that person or I don't Whatever that person really is, bug. whatever that pronoun, that bug, <laughs> bug, 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 self, <laughs> shim. But yeah, so it seems really silly, but in our culture, the the predominant problem is that that is actually an answer, yeah. And that's why they're so. That's why they're. Applying. That's why they're like, well, why do you even need to know? Yeah. Why do you even need to know that? And to the point, as you can see in the in the documentary, it uh, it almost um, reveals this like. Well, now I know why you're asking me these questions because you're obviously an ultra right conservative, mm. homophobe, transphobe. I know why you're so concerned about truth because it goes against me. Mm-hmm. And it's this is just you know. And then they, especially in academia uh, and on social media, TikTok and all that, they just retreat back into the echo chamber where everyone believes what they believe, which is nothing. And there is no like it's to. <laughs> Uh, it's to the point where, like, um, not only have they deconstructed gender, but they've even well, which we know we know this from the ar- uh, the abortion argument, but they've even deconstructed like what humanity is, yeah, and what a brain is, and what thoughts are, and what like nothing can exist. <laughs> That's how foolish this gets. Yeah, yeah. and nothing can exist except for you in the moment, which means 
well, I mean, which ultimately, I guess, leads to nihilism. But even nihilism is internally inconsistent because (laughs) it involves nothing being real. Right. Yeah. (laughs) And and, and just think about what's what the, the summary of what was said there. And everyone heard it, but I'll just summarize it. Anybody can be a woman. What's a woman? I don't know. Anyone who wants to be one. Yeah. What is it? I don't know. But anyone can do it. Do what? I don't know. That's literally where we're at. That's, yeah. the, that's the situation. And again, going back to the beginning of the show, it stems from somewhere. It comes from a place of education. People are taught that. They don't come into the world like that. They are taught that. Um, and okay, so... Well, uh, even the new Supreme Court justice can't define what well, a woman yeah, is. Well, yeah, like, so. what's a woman? I don't know. Like, this highly educated uh, woman uh, doesn't know. Can't, can't define it. Is she supposed to be interpreting... The Constitution and whether, th- whether things are consistent with the constitutional document. She's supposed to be doing the hard work of examining words in the Constitution and historical uh, context and meaning and how that applies to the world today. And she can't tell you what a woman yeah. is. My two-year-old son can tell you that. He, can, he, he has a very limited vocabulary. But if you were to ask him, who's the woman in here? Who's the girl? He'd point to his mommy and his sisters. And if you say, who are the boys? Who's the man in the room? He would point at daddy and his brothers. He's two. He knows. And yeah, I taught him that (laughs) in terms of making sure that we shape his worldview, but it's most obvious even to the two-year-old. It didn't take a lot of instruction to do that. I didn't have to say, no, you listen to me, boy. Like, Mm -hmm. this is a boy, that's a girl. He has this innate understanding because guess what? He's an image bearer of God and this is God's world. Well, one thing I pulled from that, this documentary that I'm excited to use next time we're we're talking to pro boards is, you know, we hear this all the time that we can't, we can't have an opinion because we're we're men, right? Well, I learned from this documentary that men can have babies too, right? And men men can have vaginas, so right. I, I, how are you to know that I don't, don't have like, a vagina? Some people don't like the simplicity of that response to yeah. the left today yeah. and to those that said the abortion mills, but it is a good one. Yeah. yeah, it is a darn good one. We've used it numerous times, like when someone says you can't be out here because you don't have a womb, you don't have a vagina. We just say, how do you know about what I identify as? Right. We even have videos. I, I wish I had pulled it up, knowing you were going to say that. We have videos where, like, I use that response on some crazy uh, leftist unbeliever. And there, you know, you can't have this conversation. You're a man. I'll say, how do you know what I identify as? And she immediately falls back into this submission place. She knows uh-huh. she's being watched. And she goes, oh, d- do you identify as a woman? And I'm thinking to myself, would you open your eyeballs? Look at me. Do I? Did you think I'm serious? I'm refuting you. But do you really think that? I mean, look at me. Uh, so... Yeah. Uh, yeah, anyway, anyway so sorry. let's get into uh, the final part of the show today. Let's just respond for a few moments here to Matt Walsh. Matt Walsh got some criticism um, from uh, people who said, you know, you didn't ground this in the authority of Christ and the Word of God. You didn't provide any real foundation yourself. And so while it was a good film, you really missed the mark here because uh, you didn't ground it anywhere. You didn't provide, provide any real foundation, no reference point. Um, and that's an important critique. Because it actually is a very good critique. Philosophically speaking, uh, it's a very, very good critique. Um, Because the truth is, is that Matt Walsh, if he wants to to detach this from the biblical worldview and the authority of Jesus Christ, then he's in the same position as the person with with the beard and the long hair and the dress, who is just one tribe arguing with another about what should be the case, not what ought to be the case, because an ought is an essential objective truth. You ought to do this. It is transcendent. It's above you. It's objective. It's outside of you. It's true whether you like it or not. And what this will amount to when you detach it from Christ and his authority is it's, well, what should be the case? Hmm. We should have it male, female. We should have mommies and daddies and mother roles and father roles. We should. Like, but not necessarily ought. It's just right. one tribe arguing with another. Well, and it's pragmatism. It's yeah. like whatever works, but that goes, that's just as subjective as whatever is true for me yeah. is true for me. Right. It's know? just a preference. Yeah. It's just a preference. I just, I Perfect. prefer things that work well right. in the universe, but that's not grounded in any real reality. It's Christless conservatism. Right. It's, 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 uh, it's transformation yeah. apart from regeneration. Mm-hmm. And that's not possible. Real transformation is not possible apart from regeneration. Jesus said, 
you must be born again. If there is not a new birth, there is no real transformation. It's no good. I, 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 and let me just get into to Walsh's comments here with, with this. I worked in a hospital as a chaplain for many years. And in this hospital, I would see people who were addicted to meth and heroin and all kinds of different drugs being taught for 30 days while they're being detoxed and they were in this, this facility, being taught skills, tips to make their life better, to try to be more disciplined. And what they were really being taught, I saw immediately, was to clean the outside of the cup. Mm-hmm. Jesus' indictment upon the religious people in his day was the cleaning of the outside of the cup while the inside was full of death Mm -hmm. and all the rest. Jesus indicts the Pharisees in his day, Matthew chapter 23, and the leaders uh, leaders there in in Jerusalem. He indicts them. He says, you're whitewashed tombs. On the outside, you look beautiful. On the inside, you're full of dead men's bones. You're full of rotting, stinking death inside. And so from a Christian perspective, there is no transformation apart from regeneration, no meaningful transformation apart from regeneration. And so if you just try to clean the outside of the cup, what do you have on the inside? A nation full of dead men's bones. And so what we don't want is a Christless conservatism that is a bunch of whitewashed tombs walking around, people that conform to the blessings of biblical wisdom, but on the inside, their hearts are still the same, their minds are still the same, there will be no transformation of the world with a Christless conservatism. We have to reject it as as much a false system, even though we can benefit from some of the great things someone like Mm -hmm. Matt Walsh says, um, as anything else, as any other false religion, because it is ultimately a religion in itself, uh, fundamentally in itself. And so the myth of neutrality is the problem. Here's Matt. I agree with the criticism made by Jason Whitlock and the commenter you responded to yesterday. Erasing God from the film is a fatal flaw. It's It's good, but hard to recommend as you did not ground your message in scripture. Well, yeah, I read Jason's column here. He wrote a, 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 about the film, and I texted back and forth with him a little bit about it. I'll be, on, I'll be on a show, I think, in a couple days, so we'll talk probably more about this. I just don't agree with the critique at all. Let me respond, first of all, to what you, what you just said. Uh, Jason didn't say that I erased God, but that's what you're saying, and that's, that's absurd, okay? You cannot erase God if you're speaking truth, okay? Any pursuit or defense of truth is not going to erase God, as you say, quite the opposite. Um, how do you have truth apart from the one who's the embodiment of truth? Right. Now, this, this, this is a serious critique. It's an important critique. Philosophically speaking, it's devastating. You just said that there can be truth that is divorced from the true God. But God is the truth. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. In Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so, yeah, Matt, you understand that there are truths from Scripture, and you would defend those truths. I wouldn't deny that, you're, that you would defend those truths. You acknowledge there are truths from Scripture that are, are out in the world, you see around, and they, there's, there's conformity there. You see those things. But the, the problem is, is you're talking to a world of people who are still dead in their sins and trespasses. The, the fundamental problem of humanity isn't just that people are mixed up about gender. It's that people are hostile to God. It's that people love darkness rather than the light. That's, mm. what, that's the message of Jesus. And so, yeah, you can point out observational brute facts about the world to sinful people and say, look, isn't it obvious that one plus one equals two? That's built into the system. That's a universal invariant truth. But you're going to be talking to people who actually argue today because of what they've been indoctrinated with that, well, one plus one isn't necessarily two. Isn't that just white supremacy? Yeah. Isn't that just from white colonialism? How do we know one plus one is actually two? What if it's four? Now, again, you could say, you could press on that and say, nobody builds bridges with that absurdity. No one builds bridges with that worldview. But the point is, is that you're talking to people who are rebellious and hostile to natural revelation and the way things are. The problem is deeper. It's deeper. It's not that people are basically good and they should be able to work these things out. Our reasoning faculties are completely, completely affected by our sin. Sin doesn't just affect you morally in terms of the decisions you're making with your genitals and all the rest and how you treat other human beings. Sin corrupts your reasoning faculties. You can't think properly. You can't reason. Jesus said to people, He was telling them, 
who he was, who his father was, that he was the son of God, that he's the Messiah. He's telling him and telling him and telling him. And in John 10, after he's saying, I'm the good shepherd who lays his life down for the sheep, he says to people who then respond to him, they're like, tell us, like, stop keeping us in suspense. Are you the Messiah? Jesus says to them, I told you. He didn't say, oh, shoot. Uh, <laughs> I left that part out. Like, right? Like, uh, I didn't tell you yet. No, they said, like, tell us, are you the Messiah or not? And he says, I told you. And the reason you can't hear me <coughs> is because you are not of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice and they follow me. And so he, he's telling them truth. He's telling them, telling them, telling them. They can't hear because they don't have the ability because of their sin, because of their rebellion, to actually embrace that truth. This is why you need regeneration. This is why it's a special act of the sovereign mercy and grace of God in a sin, sinner's life. But the only way that a person is going to see their sin is if they're confronted by it hmm. with God's word. And that's where the call of the gospel is. Like Jesus doesn't send people on a mission in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, when he says that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. He doesn't send them on a mission to go and preach a Christless conservatism. He doesn't go send people on a mission to just go make the world a better place. Like apply some of these wise principles to the world. Go sell those to the world. Right. No, he tells, he tells his disciples to go make disciples and to baptize them and to teach them to obey. So Matt, whether you like it or not, even with all the great things about this film, whether you like it or not, if you divorce truth from the one who is the embodiment of truth, right. you don't have what you're looking for. It's always going to be just suspended in midair. And that's the problem. And so the critique of your film, Matt, it was right. It really was. It was right. The question is whether the film should have had an explicitly sort of theological message. Should we have gone through the entire journey? And then I go back to, uh, to my to home and I talk to my wife, spoiler alert. And when I'm talking to her, should she have answered the question, by pulling out the Bible and quoting Genesis or something like that. That's the question. And I emphatically believe that we handled that the right way by not making this an explicitly theological film. That would have minimized the cultural impact in a major way by giving the left an escape hatch and making it seem as though, um, you know, criticism of gender ideology is faith-based and religious in nature. Uh, are you saying it's not? Are you saying that it's not? I mean, doesn't, doesn't the, wor the history of the world start from God's perspective? It's his word, yeah. and Matt Walsh would acknowledge it. The history of the world starts with God saying, in the beginning, God created right. the heavens and the earth. And then he says he created male and female in the image of God. He created them. Yeah. That's a better grounding. I think what you're saying, Matt, is this. And I want to say this with as much respect to you as possible. I hope you do see this. I think what you're saying is this, is if you made the film and you pointed to the authority of Christ and the word of God, it means people would have to repent. Yeah. It means people would have to repent. And you didn't want to do that. That might be too difficult. And well, I would it's pragmatism. Yeah. It means people would have to repent. They wouldn't which means the documentary wouldn't be effective in proving my point. <laughs> right. Right. And, and I mean, ultimately, yeah. like, you know, I'm not saying this exact thought process went through his head, but that's the whole point of pragmatism is like, no, see the full on gospel. That's like a lot for people who aren't believers. They'd have yeah. to repent. So we <laughs> need to give them like a little dose. We need to give, we need to show them how this really, the practical outworking of this is really true. And, yeah. um, because <clears throat> if we just give them the gospel, they'll be like, I don't believe that. Yeah, we know, which is but why you're dressing the way right. you are. This is, <laughs> and this is just right. the point. This is the yeah. point. Like, do you really believe what right. Jesus said in terms of spreading the gospel and, going all across the world and right. creating disciples. Right. Um, Teaching them to obey Jesus. Right. Like the goal of the gospel is that the world obeys Jesus. And and the, the whole point is that he was sending disciples out to people who would not believe. Right. right. Of course, many of them would. Oh, that yeah. But that, that. it wasn't just like, oh, well, you know what? I'm gonna, it, I'm gonna do a bit of uh, supernatural work here and only send you to groups that will be accepting of me. Well, I mean, if if you want to see what Joy is saying worked out practically, what did it look like? Give me like a scene. Well, after Matthew 28, 18 through 20, when Christ declares that he has all authority on earth, don't forget that, here yeah. on this planet on earth, 
Then you have the book of Acts where you see the, the apostles going out and doing precisely the thing that Joy is saying that they did. And they're going into marketplaces. They're going into the tough places of philosophical de- debate, even the Areopagus, Mars Hill. They're going everywhere. They're preaching Christ, and they're doing it in a way that is full-throated and 100 proof. And they're not mincing words, and they're telling the truth. And yeah, it, it, it is bringing riots. They're taking beatings for it. Um, but then it also says that they were increasing in their numbers in Acts chapter 9, uh, they experienced peace, and the church was being multiplied. And that was in the context of a very hostile Roman Empire where idolatry was the thing. They had temples you can go to where you can have sex with other men, and you could pay pre- temple prostitutes and all the rest. They had places where Caligula and Nero had set up temples of worship to themselves. Like you know, It wasn't like a Christian environment they were stepping into. It was a very hostile pagan environment where they were even throwing their children out uh, that they don't want and letting them die of exposure. That was the world that they lived in. And they went in, 100 proof, full-throated, gospel proclamation, God commands men everywhere to repent, Acts chapter 17. That was the message of the apostles, because they understood what I've already said, and that's that you do not have any meaningful transformation without regeneration. And so a Christless conservatism does not bring genuine transformation of the world. And I think what Matt is really saying there, if I can summarize it, is if he had made it faith-based, if he took it from the perspective of the authority of the Word of God, it would have meant people would have had to repent. Right? Yeah. You'd have to think about these deep thoughts. Like, for example, and I'm going to probably end, we'll probably end the discussion here. Matthew chapter 19, Jesus is asked a question by the Pharisees about marriage. Mm. Now, this is God incarnate. Now, Matt's a Roman Catholic. Um, I'd love to have a, a discussion with him about how a person is reconciled to God, the authority of Scripture, those sorts of things. But Matt's a Roman Catholic. He, he would say this is the Word of God. He would say it's the Word of God. And Matt believes the Trinity. He has to. He's Roman Catholic. Uh, that's the universal belief of the Christian Church, the Trinity, um, the triune nature of God. Matt's a Trinitarian. If he's not, he's not Roman Catholic. Right. And so what he believes is, is that this is God incarnate, God in the flesh. Well, here's what God in the flesh says when he's asked about marriage. In Matthew 19, 1, now when Jesus had finished these sayings, he went away from Galilee and entered the region of Judea beyond the Jordan, and large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. And Pharisees came up to him and tested him by saying, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for, here's the words, very important, any cause? The controversy in Jesus' day, it's very important, was about the Hillelite marriage clause, the any cause divorce. In other words, divorce is permissible in Scripture. It is permissible under justifiable biblical grounds, only according to God's law word. And so there was a controversy in Jesus' day between the Hillelites and the Shemites, Rabbi Shemai and Rabbi Hillel. The Hillelites believe that you could divorce her for any cause as long as you gave a certificate of divorce. So if you said, I don't like her cooking, she's not pretty anymore, she bothers me, whatever, you just give a certificate of divorce, and that's an any cause divorce. Jesus is being asked to throw his hat into the ring of the debate. Are you with Shammai Mm -hmm. or are you with Hillel? Any cause or only on biblical grounds? That's why the Pharisees are the ones bringing the question to him, by the way. And so the Pharisees asked him, any cause? He answered, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female, and said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. So the point here, why am I bringing that up? God incarnate, when he's asked a question about truth and about what ought to be the case in the issue of the ethical situation with divorce, Jesus goes back to the beginning. Didn't you read what God said? In the beginning, he created them male and female. Now note, Jesus identifies male and female, and that a man shall leave his father and mother. You've got male, female, there's the identities, and he leaves, not a dad and a dad, and a mom and a mom. He leaves behind him to go to be with his wife, become one flesh. He leaves behind him a mother and a father. So for Jesus, God incarnate, he's defining from the beginning what God said. He made male and female. That's what he made yeah. when he created. It's the foundation of all the world, male, female. And when you get married, you leave a mom and a dad behind, male and female behind, to go be joined to another female, male and female. And so that's how the world works. That's God incarnate's definition of how this all works. And what I want to say as a minister of the gospel is that's where we should stand. 
That's where you should stand. Amen. And someone says, well, I don't really like that because that means people are going to be confronted with Scripture. They may not agree with it. Yeah, I know. That's the world you live in, a world full of sinners. They won't. That dress up like <laughs> right. women right. when they're actually men with beards. Right. Yeah. You think you're going to tell the guy who has the audacity and the, just the gall to dress up in a dress with a beard that he should transform his behavior like your tribe likes? Right. No, it's, it's a hard issue. Exactly he's right. doing that because he's rebelling against his creator. And if you don't bring the word of his creator to him, there is no repentance. Yep. It is transformation without regeneration. It'll never work. The world's not going to change that way. And let's be honest, that's not the mission that Jesus sent his people on the world to do. That's not our mission. We're here to win this world to Christ, and it's the gospel that is the power of God for salvation, not this Christless conservatism. We're not trying to make people more moral only to send them to hell. You know, that's essentially like, well, we can... We can make them not act this way by providing a natural evidence that they're wrong it's like okay so you may you may which like we've been saying you won't most likely but you may change their mind on this but without a prophetic vision <laughs> prophetic witness they're still going to go to hell without the gospel yeah. they're still going to go to hell there's there you're not going to change their minds god needs to change their minds needs to give them a new heart and so that that's got to be the underlying theme of, of anything like this that's right well, I enjoyed the show today, you guys. Yeah, yeah it was mm -hmm. good. I think it was good great. Show. I hope it was a blessing to everybody. I want to encourage you again uh, to go to apologiastudios.com, A-P-O-L-O-G-I-A studios.com. Sign up for All Access. When you sign up for All Access, you truly partner with us in this ministry. You make everything possible. All the people coming to Christ, out of, out of the cults, out of atheism, all the babies being saved, all the teaching ministry. It's all made possible because someone just like you signed up at ApologiaStudios.com for all access. You get all the additional content. You partner with us in ministry. We're thankful for all of you. Don't forget to go to EndAbortionNow.com. Get your, your church signed up to go out and start saving lives. We have more coming this year, some important things. Be in prayer for that, and please give towards that work uh, as much as you can. Don't forget to go to ReformCon.org and get those tickets get before those they tickets. sell out uh, for ReformCon.org. Reformation Day weekend this year. That's Luke the Bear. Peace out. That's Joy the Girl. See ya. I'm Jeff the Calm and the Ninja. We'll catch you next week right here on Apologia Studios, Apologia Radio.